time, so I guess you can start. So okay. we have uh, the third lecture by Yasin Ali Ahmoud about uh, CMB. Okay, so to summarize what we're gonna talk about, we will talk about this relationship between baryons and photons through Thomson scattering. And specifically, we're gonna derive the collision null Boltzmann equation for photons. And this is basically the meat of the calculation uh, that goes into uh, CMB anisotropy calculations. So let's get right to it. I'm gonna highlight in my slides what I go through, and we're gonna go through the equations together. So first of all, let's remember the definition, the photon occupation number is just the number of photons per quantum state. This is this function F gamma, which depends on time, it depends on position and on photon momentum. And this is related closely to the phase space density of photons just by a prefactor of two over H cubed. Okay, so I will use sometimes phase space density instead of photon occupation number, but it's all related by some constants. Okay, now this photon occupation number here is equal to some background value plus some perturbation. So our goal is to study the perturbation. The background value is the uh, black body spectrum of the CMB. So the occupation number for a black body spectrum is just this Planck function here, one over exponential of the photon momentum over the temperature minus one. So what we're gonna do is uh, write down equations for the perturbation delta F, and we're gonna work at linear order in perturbations not only for F, but for all other cosmological perturbations. Okay, so we want to write this Boltzmann equation, which states how along photon trajectories does the photon occupation number or phase space density change. So if it was collisionless, the right-hand side would be zero, but because it's collisional, we have a collision operator on the right-hand side. This collision operator is Local is spa in space. So colli the collisions here, we're talking about collisions with uh, free electrons through Thomson scattering. They happen locally in space. So this, to describe it, I don't need any GR. Everything happens uh, locally in space. To describe the left-hand side, I'm going to need a little bit of GR, but actually we're going to do everything in a Newtonian way. And I'm going to tell you how it generalizes to GR and you can work it out in the homework. So how does this collision operator look like? So F, remember, up to some constant is the number density of photons per uh, volume in momentum space and per volume in, in real space. So this collision operator tells me how F changes. So it changes in two ways. First, I can have collisions which go from momenta P prime to uh, momentum P. So P here is the momentum, I'm, I'm asking what is the rate of change of the phase space distribution at momentum P. So this term, this first term says how much photons I'm adding from other momenta to the momentum P. So this is going to be proportional to the phase space density at this other momentum P prime. And this term here is due to stimulated scatterings. So that's the adding terms. And then this second line here is when we subtract photons from P to uh, P prime to all the other possible directions P prime. Okay. And again, this term here is also a stimulated scattering into the new direction, the new momentum P prime. This gamma here, this D gamma DP is a differential rate per momentum volume interval. So this is so far a rather generic collision operator. Okay, now we, the goal for us is to specify what it is for Thomson scattering. So Thomson scattering. So first of all, what did I, yesterday I showed you just from using simple kinematics, conservation of energy and momentum, that the rate, the fractional change of the photon energy or the photon momentum in a Thomson scattering event is of order photon momentum over mass of the electron, which is a order of the temperature of the photons over electron mass. And around redshift of 1000, this temperature is about 0.2 EV and electron mass is 0.5 MeV. So this is a very small number. Okay, so less than one part in a million. So basically photons don't change at the redshift of interest, don't really change their momentum 
one scattering. So we're gonna assume that Thomson scattering does not change the photon energy. However, it can change the photon direction of propagation. So mathematically, what does mean? We, it means that this differential scattering rate for going from momentum P to momentum P prime, this is going to be proportional to the total rate of Thomson scattering. So the number density of electrons times the Thomson cross section. This second term here tells us that the momentum magnitude, i.e. the energy is conserved. This is just some normalization so that this can integrate over D3P to the correct value. And this last term here is the angular distribution for Thomson scattering. Uh, this angular distribution is given here in this equation. Okay, so this is something that integrates to uh, unity when I integrate over all final directions. And it has a monopole and a dipole contribution. Okay, I see there's a question in the chat. That moment is before or after the collision. Uh, so which moment, the momentum you mean? So P is before collision and P prime is after collision. However, in this, in this term here, the second term, this equation, in this equation I'm saying that we go from P to P prime. So we lose, that's why there's a negative sign, but in this equation we go from P prime to P. Okay, good, good, all right. So now rewriting this collision operator for Thompson scattering, we have just replacing this d gamma dp by this total Thompson scattering rate times this integral over final direction or initial direction, depending on the term, n prime, uh, where n again is the direction of photon propagation, times this angular distribution of Thompson scattering and now I just have again my F uh, here with the stimulated emission terms. Now this P here is the same uh, if I go from N to N prime or from N prime to N, okay? And as a consequence, you can see that these two terms, like when they multiply, this times this and this times this cancel out. So actually we can neglect the stimulated emission terms. Okay. So we arrive at this uh, simpler, uh, more compact expression for the Thomson scattering operator, okay? Now, again, remember that we want to deal with, uh, to study the perturbations of photon distribution about the black body distribution. So this black body distribution here is a perfect black body with the same temperature in all directions. It's an isotropic and homogeneous black body. And in particular, if I plug this into this equation, you see that the mean, the background black body distribution cancels out because this would only differ through the direction dependence. And so as a consequence, the only piece that remains is this delta F. So this entire collision term here is linear in delta F. It's linear in the photon phase space distribution perturbation. And as a consequence, we only need to care about the background, the mean free electron density. We don't need to account for perturbations in the free electron density if we work at linear order. The question, um, so quantum corrections on P, uh, so I guess relativistic corrections, because this is still a quantum calculation, but you can neglect relativistic corrections at energies much less than the electron mass. Okay, otherwise you have to account for the klein nishina cross section instead of uh, the Thomson cross section. So the energies of the photons again are 0.2 electron volts, which is 10 to the minus six times the electron mass. So we can completely neglect any uh, klein nishina corrections in this term. The terms cancel here, you see that here I have F of P n prime times F of P n, and here I have F of P n times F of P n prime, so they cancel out. So in fact, if you look at the standard derivations, they don't necessarily even mention this, but you should have stimulated scatterings. And in fact, this do matter 
for the thermalization problem for spectral distortions. They do matter for the heat exchange rate with baryons, but they drop out in terms of the anisotropies. So again, what we only need to uh, keep is the background free electron fraction, which is what we talked about yesterday the ionization history of the universe, but only in the average sense. We don't need to compute the fluctuations of uh, the free electron fraction above about the mean, okay, which is convenient because otherwise it would add a, a level of complication. Okay, so now we are going to change variables. Instead of dealing with F gamma, the photon occupation number, I'm gonna define this function theta, which for now is going to depend on, temp on time, t, on position, and on photon momentum. And so basically this function here, e, one over e to the p over t minus one, is uh, I can just invert this function. And so I can define theta in such a way that my uh, perturbed photon distribution function is equal to the unperturbed photon distribution function evaluated at p over one plus theta. So basically this theta is a temperature perturbation. However, for now, it could in principle depend not only on time, space, but also on photon energy. So it would mean that in principle, it's not necessarily black body spectrum, but we will see that the equation for theta does not have any dependence, explicit dependence on P. So in fact, theta will not depend on the magnitude of photon momentum. I want to point out, uh, so that's something that you will encounter a lot in, uh, when you do physics, that's notations can be confusing. So I want to point out that here I'm using this big letter theta, it's the standard notation here. And this is not at all the same thing as the small theta that Fabian Schmidt is using in, in his lectures, which this would be the divergence of velocity of dark matter. And here, this is a photon temperature perturbation. This is a big theta and this other one was a small theta. Okay, so now if we take this equation and we are going to tailor expand it around a small theta to linear order because we only do linear perturbation theory, it's pretty easy. We just get that F, the photon occupation number, F gamma, is the background F gamma minus P df gamma dp times theta. Okay, so this is just a change of variables from delta F to, so this whole thing is delta F with the minus sign, two theta. Those are equivalent variables as written here, okay? These are completely equivalent variables. All right, now uh, before moving on, let me have a cup of coffee and uh, point out a very important thing, which is that the photon occupation number or the photon phase space distribution or anything's phase space distribution this quantity is a scalar quantity in the sense that it is frame uh, invariant. So what does it mean exactly? If A and B are two different reference frames, which have some velocity with respect to one another, then if, I, if the momentum P has value uh, PB uh, as observed in the frame B and value PA as observed in the frame A, then the phase space distribution F in the frame B is equal to FA evaluated at the corresponding momentum. Okay, this is a scalar quantity. So if B has some velocity V, B, A relative to A, then simple, uh, if, you, if you just do the Lorentz transformation to, uh, for a small velocity V, B, A, you should be able to derive this equation that P, A is P, B plus magnitude of P times the relative velocity. And so now if I use this property of frame independence of the photon occupation number, you find you will replace here. So uh, conveniently I can go like this. Okay, this PA, I'm gonna replace PA by PB plus P times VBA, this whole expression. And then I'm going to tailor expand this in the next line right here. And now uh, if we are considering linear perturbations, if this relative velocity between these two frames is itself a small quantity, uh, then, okay, you still see me? Yeah, 
I think I had some error message. Then at linear order, uh, we get this relationship between the uh, phase space distribution in frame B and phase space distribution in frame A. Okay. So this in terms of temperatures. Yasin, Yasin, please. Uh, I missed the point. Uh, are you going uh, to discuss first the distortions and the later on CMB and isotropies? I'm right. only discussing uh, CMB and isotropies now. Ah, okay. I'm only discussing CMB and isotropies. Okay. okay. I'm sorry, my, my uh, iPad dropped from the meeting, so I'm just rejoining the meeting. Not sure why. Okay. So, uh, Raul, you're going to have to allow me to share my screen again. Yes, I'm here. Wait a second. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, I'm, I'm the iPad. Uh. Yeah. Uh, it should be, you know, your okay, post. Good. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I don't know why it dropped. I don't know if there's a time limit or what, but. Uh... Okay. We are back. Good. So now if I go back to the uh, perturbed, uh, I, I rewrite this in terms of the temperature perturbation. What we find is that the temperature perturbation observed in frame B is equal to the temperature perturbation observed in frame A minus relative velocity dot into N. This makes sense very intuitively. Suppose I'm in frame B, okay, this is me, the I in frame B, and I'm moving with some velocity this way with respect to frame A. If I look at photons coming from this direction, if they have some temperature theta A in frame, in frame A and I'm moving towards them, they're gonna appear as blue shifted, they're gonna appear hotter. And conversely, if I'm moving away from the direction where photons are coming, they're gonna appear colder. So this is just what this equation is telling us here. All right, so we had arrived at this equation for the Thompson collision operator. However, one thing what we had neglected, we didn't mention at all, is that this, uh, P here only holds in the rest frame of the electrons. If the electrons are moving, I have to account for this. So really this collision operator, I've derived it in the rest frame of the electrons, which is also the rest frame of the baryons. So now I'm gonna reestablish the fact that these are all quantities to be evaluated in the baryons rest frame where the Thomson scattering cross section has this angular dependence that I had uh, defined earlier on. Now, baryons have a velocity VB relative to the co-moving frame. This is by definition VB. And so in the baryons rest frame from where we just derived, the temperature observed in that rest frame is the co-moving frame uh, CMB temperature perturbation minus this VB dot N. So we have to replace all of these terms here by uh, this combined expression right here. Like that. Now uh, the term VB dot N, N here that comes from this guy here simplifies. Uh, actually, sorry, the term VB dot N prime. So this uh, angular dependence by definition is the angular PDF. So it integrates to unity over all N prime. And if you remember, this P is 3 over 16 pi times 1 plus n dot n prime squared. So it is symmetric in plus and minus n prime. And as a consequence, it integrates to 0 when multiplied by n prime. Okay, it has 0 dipole. Thomson scattering is monopolar and quadrupolar. And so as a consequence, the integral of this term from this piece here uh, drops out. So we are left with this collision operator. It's an integral over all directions n prime times temperature perturbation in direction n prime minus temperature perturbation in direction n plus this term here, which accounts for the fact that baryons are moving. And in the baryon stress frame, the CMB appears to have a dipole VB dot n minus VP dot N. Okay, so this was all for the uh, right-hand side and now we're gonna talk about the left-hand side. 
the Boltzmann equation. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to simply do a purely Newtonian derivation. I'm going to assume that the, uh, I'm going to neglect the expansion of the universe. Okay, I'm going to assume that photons can be treated like if they were non-relativistic, because I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with general relativity. If you are familiar with GR, uh, I, there's one of the exercises in the homework that guides you through, through uh, doing this correctly for uh, relativistic calculation. Okay, so this df dt along photon trajectory is just given by this right-hand side from the chain rule. Okay, so this is the partial time derivative plus the dx dt along trajectory times partial x derivative, dp dt partial p derivative. Okay, so it's just a chain rule. Okay, now, Remember that in the background unperturbed universe, this F bar gamma, which is the average uh, photon occupation number, it is homogeneous. It is the same at every position in space. So its gradient here does not, uh, is zero, the background gradient. So this term is purely a perturbation. Only the perturbations come in here. The temperature of photons will make some difference in number of particle created after the collisions. No, so the temperature, so Thomson scattering does not change the number of particles. It simply shifts their, uh, the direction where they come from. And this temperature, yeah. Photons, I never said photons are normal realistic, sorry. So what I meant is that I'm gonna treat I'm going to pretend, and you'll see in a minute what I mean exactly. Okay, I'm going to pretend uh, that photons are uh, obey Newton's laws. Okay, in terms of their change of uh, trajectory uh, in gravitational potentials, and I'll tell you how you should do it properly. So this term is a pure perturbation. So since I'm working at linear order, I can. I it's enough to. It, is, it suffices to treat this term to zeroth order in perturbation to just account for the background uh, evolution. And so to zeroth order dx dt, remember that we're using units in which the speed of light is one. So dx dt is nothing but the direction of propagation of the photons, okay? It's really C times the direction of propagation of the photons. Next, so, here, this is easy. We have this term. This is n hat. Now we want to deal with this term. This is where I'm making this Newtonian approximation. Okay? And because the correct treatment would be a little bit longer to do in the lecture. So this is my Newtonian approximation. If you had a regular, uh, if you had a non-relativistic uh, particle, dv dt dmv dt would be equal to minus m grad phi and i'm gonna pretend that photons satisfy dp dt is minus p grad phi newtonian the actual equation satisfies by photons is not very different from this okay and again you're going to derive this in uh, the homework so this is a pure perturbation okay so in a homogeneous universe there are no gravitational potentials so this is a pure perturbation so this means that back in this equation, again, since we work at linear order, we can uh, just account for the homogeneous piece of this term because this is a pure perturbation. So I can replace the F gamma dp by the uh, F here by the background F. Okay, so this is what I do here. We replace this by the background, the F gamma dp. But this is just a function of the magnitude of p, okay? And so if I ask what is the gradient of a function that only depends on the magnitude of a vector, then it's going to be just along the direction of this vector. So n hat is the direction of propagation of the photon times the, the straight regular derivative of this function. Okay, so um, lastly, for this df, 
the T term here. Again, if we neglect expansion. So all of this can be redone accounting for expansion by just using appropriate moment, rescaled momentum variables, okay? Uh, but so if we pretend there's no expansion, then this df gamma dt is zero at constant momentum p. So uh, I can replace this df bar, the, the df gamma dt by just the pure perturbation term. So it's going to be equal to this conversion factor from f to theta, the temperature perturbation. Uh, remember this comes from this equation here. Okay, so I'm just gonna basically just dealing with this second term here. I'm saying that this does not depend on time. So, uh, and same thing for the uh, spatial gradient. This is just up to a conversion factor, the spatial gradient of theta. So all this to say that with our simplification, this Newtonian approximation simplification, the left-hand side of the uh, Boltzmann equation is this overall conversion factor times partial time derivative of theta plus n dot spatial gradient of theta plus n dot grad phi Newtonian. Okay, this accounts for, this is the Newtonian approximation of the evolution of photon momentum. And now remember that this must be equal to the collision operator. And this collision operator, we just derived here, has also this minus p df gamma dp, blah, blah, blah. So if I divide everything by this prefactor, we arrive at this equation here. This is now rewriting the Boltzmann equation for this temperature perturbation theta, all right? Now this is again in the uh, Newtonian approximation. What happens if you properly account for the relativistic approximation, the relativistic treatment? So really what you want to do, you want to study geodesics of photons, which are null geodesics in this metric. I also want to point out, I think that Valerie is using a different convention for a fine psi Again, I'm sorry, but uh, different people use different conver conventions. So here, this is the convention I'm using. Uh, the point is that there are two scalar potentials. The one that appears in the T, T part of the metric is the one that plays the role of the Newtonian potential for non-relativistic particles. And the term in the spatial spatial part of the metric only affects the, the trajectories of uh, relativistic particles. So if you treat these uh, photon geodesics correctly, what you will do first is going to replace, instead of, instead of time, you're going to use conformal time. This will make a factor of scale factor uh, show up here. Note, by the way, that the right-hand side of the Boltzmann equation, because it is local in space, does not carry for uh, relativistic corrections. And in any case, it's a perturbation already. And next, this will be replaced by n dot grad psi minus phi dot, which is what I've written here. And this spatial derivative here is the commoving gradient, okay? All right, so, so far, all I've done is saying, I'm gonna replace F gamma of time or conformal time, commoving coordinate, Moment and three uh, momentum of the photons by a change of variables. I, um, I'm talking about theta instead. So in principle, this theta depends on the momentum p. It depends on photon energy. If it did depend on photon energy, it would mean that it's no longer a black body spectrum. It's some distorted black body spectrum in addition from, from being uh, inhomogeneous. But if you look at this Boltzmann equation, it has absolutely no dependence, no explicit dependence on p on the momentum of photons. So if you start with some initial conditions, so if theta is initially independent of P, if I start with a black body spectrum, which is perturbed, but, but yet a perfect black body spectrum, then the evolution will preserve this independence of P. 
This comes from the fact that the, uh, the Thomson scattering is achromatic. Okay? It does not depend on energy. And one of the things I encourage you to do in the homework is just as an open question, but think about what, how would you deal with a process which would be chromatic? Imagine, for example, that photons scatter off some unknown dark matter particle. Maybe this dark matter particle has uh, a, a small charge, in which case it would have a Thomson-like scattering, but maybe it has a very small electric dipole moment, in which case it would have some energy dependent cross section. And so we think about how one would go about and solving, uh, treating this problem. Okay. Are there any questions so far? So um, to summarize this part, we can drop the dependence on momentum on this photon temperature perturbation. And so now this theta, you can really think of it as a temperature perturbation. Right? You really have a black body spectrum. However, it's a direction dependent temperature perturbation. So a real black body spectrum would be have the same temperature in all directions. And here we have a black body, which if you look at different directions, has a different temperature. Okay, so now we're gonna connect this equation with fluid variables. And I think this is something that Fabian talked about also in his lectures. So the big difference with Fabian's lectures is that Fabian was dealing with collision, is dealing with collisionless uh, cold dark matter. And here we're dealing with collision all, uh, highly collision all, uh, photons and uh, baryons. And also one big difference is that here we are linearizing all the equations, whereas Fabian was dealing with fully nonlinear equations. Okay, so fluid variables. So first and foremost, the energy density of photons is the integral over all momenta of the photon phase space density, which is the number of photons per volume, per momentum uh, volume element, times P, which is the energy of one photon. Now I'm gonna replace this F gamma. Remember that this is my definition of theta is that F gamma of P is just equal to the unperturbed photon distribution at p over one plus theta. This d3p here is d2n d2p times p squared. I'm actually let me write it somewhere else because it's going to be confusing. So d3p is p squared dp d2n. So I'm writing it down at the next equation here. This p cubed comes from this p here. Now I'm gonna change variables. I'm gonna redefine q equals to this p over one plus theta. I'm gonna extract my one plus theta to the fourth power because I have four powers of q here. This I can now linearize. So this, this one plus theta to the fourth power is one plus four theta. And so then you see that you obtain that the photon energy density perturbation is equal to one plus four times theta zero times the mean density, where this theta zero is the, in, the angle average of the photon temperature perturbation, which is the monopole of the photon temperature perturbation. Okay, so this is the average over all angles. So the energy density perturbation, this delta gamma is four times the temperature monopole perturbation. Again, this is just simply saying that the photon energy density equals this temperature to the fourth power. If I perturb the temperature, the angle average temperature, then I get uh, four times a relative perturbation in the energy density. Okay, now let's talk about photon velocity, because this is a bit of a tricky concept. Photons, of course, move at the speed of light. So here I'm going to be talking about the photon bulk flow. Okay. And this is related to the photon temperature dipole moment. So let's put this in a more quantitative way. So we saw before that the temperature perturbation of observed in some frame B is related to the temperature observed in some frame A minus the relative velocity dotted into the direction of propagation. 
So if I integrate these uh, two, I multiply those this relationship by n hat. I integrate over n hat, and I use the fact here that the average of n hat i and hat j is just one third of delta i j. To derive this, the argument goes that this must be an isotropic tensor with two indices. Well, the only isotropic tensor with two indices is the Kronecker delta. And to figure out the coefficient, you just, for example, uh, take the trace of this and you're gonna get this coefficient of one third. And in the homework, you're, gonna, you're asked to do something similar when you have n hat i, n hat j, n hat k, n hat l. So if you have four n hats. Okay, so we are going to define V gamma, the photon bulk velocity, not the velocity of individual photons, but this is some average quantity, as three times the average of n hat theta n. So this is three times the average of n hat theta n. So this, this uh, notation here means average over all directions, okay? So for now, I've just defined a vector so now if I go in the frame gamma, which moves at some velocity V gamma relative to the co-moving frame, and I use this equation here, okay? So the integral, and at B, I'm gonna replace by gamma, and A is gonna be the co-moving frame. Then you see that you get that the integral of the dipole moment of the photon temperature perturbation in this frame gamma is simply zero, okay? So basically V gamma is, or the photon bulk velocity is defined as the velocity with respect to the co-moving frame of the unique frame into, in which the photon temperature perturbation has no dipole moment. You can think, think about it differently if you want that, you know, the, the observed uh, I mean, it's, it's all related to the fact that when I change frames, I, this generates a dipole in the new, uh, in the new frame. So this photon uh, bulk velocity V gamma is related to the photon momentum density. And so I'm calling this this curly P vector. And in the homework, you're asked to show that this is equal, the momentum density of photons is four thirds of their energy density average times this bulk velocity. In contrast, the energy, the momentum density of baryons would be, and we're gonna use this uh, tomorrow or maybe at the end of this lecture, PB is rho B times the bulk velocity of baryons. So here there's a factor of four third. Okay, next fluid variable the photon stress tensor. So again, I think Fabian talked about this, we have the density perturbation, the velocity, and also have the stress sensor. Stress sensor is the generalization of the pressure. So it's the flux of momentum, uh, the flux of momentum I in the direction J. And it's given by this expression here for photons. So this is the number density of photons per uh, D3P. This P and I would be the momentum that carry in the I direction. And this NJ is basically the velocity, which is uh, one in the units of the speed of flight uh, in the J direction. Uh, what can be a bulk velocity of the photon? Is it linked to the expansion of the universe? So if, if we consider a completely homogeneous universe, unperturbed universe, expanding, still expanding, photons would have no bulk velocities. Okay, photons would be have a temperature, which is exactly the same in all directions. It would change in time, but it would be the same in all directions. So this bulk velocity of photons is really a concept that means that there is a dipole of the, in the photon temperature. So if I look in one direction, if I'm, for example, we are moving with respect to the CMB rest frame. So really, you know, the CMB maps that you see are after subtracting the dipole. Really, the first thing that we see in the CMB is a big dipole. Dipole. We see a CMB to be hotter in the direction towards which we are moving. Okay, so we can define a frame in which 
the CMB temperature is has no dipole moment. Okay, and so this frame has some velocity, which is you know gauge dependent. So there's a gauge dependence in defining these uh, these velocities, but it's uh, having fixed some gauge. This frame has some velocity with respect to the co-moving observers. So it's not related to the expansion of the universe. It's related to having an anisotropy in the photon uh, distribution. Okay, so here I'm going to do the same trick as before. Replace this f gamma of p by this average f gamma of p over one plus theta. Do my change of variables. I have four powers of p, so this pulls out the one plus theta to the fourth power, which is one plus four theta when I uh, linearize it. And then this is going to pull out a mean photon density, and you should check these equations for yourselves if it's going a little bit fast, times this integral here. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write uh, that on the one hand, this term has a pure monopolar term. So the average of this and i and j over all directions is one third of delta ij, as I mentioned before. So um, if I separate, so I'm going to write an i and j is one third of delta ij plus an i and j minus one third of delta ij. Okay. So when I do, when I consider this first term here, this will give me the angle average of theta. So this first term here will pull out this one plus four theta zero, which is the photon monopole. So now the part of the stress tensor, which is diagonal, this is exactly what we call the pressure. So the pressure is one third of the trace of the stress tensor. So this is just the pressure perturbation. It's four third of rho gamma times theta zero. Uh, intrinsic dipolar contribution. Yeah, the, so, so the, 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 I'm assuming scalar initial conditions, in which case, I don't think there would be any, I'm not sure whether it would mean intrinsic dipole because in any case you can always, a dipole is, is very much, very much frame dependent quantity. Okay, I can always cancel a dipole by moving into a frame with the correct velocity. So it's, a, it's really a, a completely frame dependent quantity. You can always define frames where there's no dipole. In some sense, I could you know, maybe choose a reference frame in which V gamma is always equal to zero. Just like the synchronous gauge, for example, is a frame where uh, the cold dark matter velocity is equal to zero. At the end of the day, what we'll get is an equation which only depends on relative velocities, and those are frame independent, as we'll, as we'll see uh, shortly. So the point here is that this first term is the pressure, and so this represents the pressure perturbation. And the second term is the part of the stress sensor which has no trace, the trace-free part, sigma i, i, little sigma i, i is zero. This is called the anisotropic stress. And this anisotropic stress, defined in this way, I've just chosen this constant here to match with the, the literature. For example, mine Birchinger is a very important reference. This is related to the quadrupole moment of theta. Okay, so the energy density is up to a constant. The monopole of theta, the bulk velocity is up to a constant, the dipole moment of theta, and this anisotropic stress is the quadrupole moment of theta. Okay, so this temperature anis uh, anisotropy, I can write it as a linear sum of a pure monopole, of a pure dipole, plus some coefficient times an i and j times the anisotropic stress tensor. Uh, this is a pure quadrupole. And you're asking the homework to figure out why this is exactly, why exactly this is five halves. Okay, this is just uh, involving some integrals of uh, angular dependence, plus high order terms. Beyond quadrupole, it's the octopole, hexadecapole, et cetera, et cetera, okay? 
those terms are such that they have zero mean. If you multiply them by n hat and you integrate, you, you get zero. If you multiply by n i and j and you integrate, you also get zero. So they have zero monopole, zero dipole, and zero quadrupole. OK, so now we're going to rewrite the collision term, the Thomson collision term, in terms of these fluid variables, the photon density perturbation, the photon bulk velocity, and high order terms. So recall that this Thomson collision operator is in now in terms of conformal time. This is what there's this A here. A times NE sigma Thomson times some integral minus theta plus VB dot N, where this integral is integral over N prime of this Thomson angular dependence times theta of N prime. Now here, as I was mentioning before, this uh, Thomson angular dependence has contains a monopole plus a quadrupole. Quadrupole is just something that is quadratic in and uh, in the direction n prime. So this is really n dot n prime squared. So this is the quadrupole part. So I will do the same trick as before, which is I'm going to write n i, so n prime i, n prime j, one third of delta i j plus a pure quadrupole. OK. So this is what I'm doing here. This term corresponds to this first piece here. When I dot it into n hat twice, and then this term corresponds to this other piece here, okay? And so now this term gives me precisely the photon monopole theta zero. And this term gives me up to some constant and I and J dotted into the photon anisotropic stress, i.e. the photon quadrupole moment. So again, I encourage you to go through this. And if you find any uh, errors in the coefficients, please let me know because this is easy to make errors here. Is the monopole physically relevant? So the monopole, uh, I'm not sure by, by what you mean by physically relevant, but we will see tomorrow that the monopole, we don't, it's not relevant in terms of the anisotropies. Uh, when we compute the CMB power spectrum, we really talk about anisotropies, i.e. anything which is beyond the monopole. And in fact, even the dipole is not relevant because we have some motion with uh, this, this dipole is pure uh, frame dependent effect that we can get rid of by changing coordinate uh, system, by changing the frame, by like a Lorentz transformation. So the monopole and the dipole of the CMB don't have uh, any, are not used, uh, yeah. They're frame dependent and they're not relevant in this sense. But the monopole still, so this is what in terms of what we observe now today, but still the monopole does enter into predicting what we observe today, as we will see uh, tomorrow. And perhaps, I'm not sure exactly if I'm reading your correct question correctly, but maybe what you're touching on here is the question of gauge invariance. So you can also, change gauges and you can probably uh, use a gauge where photons have a uniform uh, energy density, in which case it would not have a monopole, but then this would also change all the other quantities. But the, at the end of the day, what is observed will be gauge invariant. So we arrive then at this rewriting of the collision term of the Boltzmann equation. It has a monopole, the baryon velocity, some coefficient times the photon quadrupole moment, minus theta of n. So remember that this minus theta of n oh, froze, came from um, physically, we're saying the photon phase space density is increased by photons that scatter into direct momentum direction n, and it is decreased by the rate of photons scattering out of the direction n. So this is this term minus theta n. It's photons scattering out of the direction n with rate n e times sigma Thompson. OK, so now let's take the moments of this collision operator. If I take its monopole, I, if I average it over all directions n. This, by the way, if I don't write 
theta dependence. So this is no longer something that depends on, on sorry, if I don't write an n hat dependence, this is no longer something that depends on n hat, to be very clear. Vb does not depend on n hat. Sigma ij does not depend on n hat. Those are moments, those are averages of functions of n hat. So when I average this over directions, this remains itself, it's just a constant, it doesn't depend on n hat. This vb dot n is a pure dipole. It averages to zero when I average over directions. This is, this n i n j averages to one third delta i j, but this is trace free. So this also will average to zero. And then when I average over n hat, this averages to theta zero. And so you see that I get this theta zero minus theta zero, which is zero. Okay, so the monopole of the collision operator uh, is zero. Now, if I compute the monopole of the left-hand side of the Boltzmann equation, sorry, my, my pad is uh, freezing, okay. So this is the uh, left-hand side of the collision equation. If I take its monopole, I'm gonna get the first term here will give me the monopole of theta. So this dot means derivative, partial derivative with respect to conformal time. So I'm gonna get theta zero dot plus here, I can just interchange gradient and n hat. So this is going to give me the gradient of the dipole of theta. This is going to, uh, this psi is not dependent on angle. So I only have an n hat. So I have a pure dipole, which gives me no monopole. And then phi dot. If I rewrite this in terms of photon fluid variables, I get this perturbed uh, photon density. Here is the divergence of the photon bulk flow minus phi dot. So the bottom line is that the monopole of the Boltzmann equation is nothing but the linearized continuity equation, okay? If you forget about for a minute about this phi dot, this phi dot is just a relativistic correction. This delta, three quarters of delta gamma, here remember this is the energy density perturbation, but photon energy density goes as t to the fourth and photon number density goes as t cubed. So this three quarters of delta gamma is just the fractional perturbation in photon number density. So this equation is an equation that, a spec that is nothing but photon number conservation, okay? And so this is simply saying that Thomson scattering, so there was a question earlier on, does not change the number of photons. So photon number is conserved as it should. The second moment of the Boltzmann equation is going to uh, tell us about momentum exchange between baryons and photons. So again, going back to uh, this equation here, if I multiply this by n hat and I average over directions n, the first term will be zero because this is a pure monopole. This is a pure dipole, it will average to zero. So this will give me when I multiply by n hat and average over n hat, I'm gonna, it's gonna give me one third of VB. And then this one, when I multiply by n hat and average, it's gonna give me one third of V gamma by definition. So the right hand side, the collision operator dipole moment is just A and E sigma Thompson times one third of VB minus V gamma. And as I said a few minutes ago, you see that whenever the velocities appear in terms of uh, um, physical quantities, it's really only, only relative velocities. So it's really the relative velocity of baryons and photons. This is a physical measurable frame independent quantity. Now, if I do the same trick, if I study the dipole moment of the left-hand side of the Boltzmann equation, after you go through the algebra, you're gonna get one third of the time derivative of the photon block velocity plus one third of this grad theta zero. This corresponds to grad P. Okay, so photons have a perturbed pressure, uh, have a per pressure perturbation, which is itself proportional to the density of perturbation. Uh, so that's why it's proportional to theta zero. Okay, the photon temperature monopole perturbation. Then you also get from this term, this is gonna pull out the, photon gradient, the gradient of the photon anisotropic stress. 
And finally, this term gives you grad of the potential psi. So this equation, if we forget for a minute about the right-hand side, tells me that is the Newtonian, you can think of it in a Newtonian way. I'm just saying like the dv dt is minus grad p over rho. Here I have a four-third because the photon momentum density is four-third of rho gamma times vb minus grad of the stress tensor, anisotropic stress tensor, minus grad psi. But here I have an additional term, which is proportional to the rate of Thomson scattering times the difference between baryon and photon velocity. This term quantifies the exchange of momentum between photons and baryons through Thomson scattering. And this is, uh, this is this big arrow always drawing between photons and baryons. It's this exchange of uh, momentum. So we can keep on going, taking the second order, the second moment of the Boltzmann equation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm not gonna do that here. Uh, to do this in a more um, systematic way, what one should do is to work in Fourier space. So you do the Fourier transform of this temperature perturbation. Instead of theta of eta x and n, we work with theta of eta k and n. Then to define these uh, multiple moments, you can do a, decompose this Fourier component into a Legendre polynomial expansion. Okay. So those would be monopole, dipole, quadrupole, etc. And they are related. Uh, they're, I mean, exactly the same ones with the correct proportional, if you have the, the correct proportional of the constants to the theta zero is the photon Monopole theta one is proportional to the gradient of the, the photon velocity, et cetera, et cetera. So just like you see here that in the continuity equation, the rate of change of the monopole is related to the gradient of the dipole. In the momentum equation, the rate of change of the dipole is related to the gradient of the quadrupole. Same thing, these uh, theta Ls, the photon multiple moments, they satisfy an infinite series of coupled differential equations where theta L is related to L plus one and L minus one. So actually here you see also that the B, D gamma, which is L equals one, the dipole is also related to theta zero with the monopole. Okay, so they form an infinite hierarchy of coupled differential equations. This is called the Boltzmann hierarchy. And you can read all about it in, for example, this classic paper by Mein Mer Bernschiger, 1995. So to summarize and to conclude this lecture, if my iPad allows me, doesn't seem to allow me. Okay, I'm sorry, it doesn't, it's a bit blocked. So there are two equivalent ways completely 100% equivalent ways to write the Boltzmann equation for photons. First, there is this way where I write the left-hand side as the total derivative of theta along photon trajectories equals to this collision operator. Inside this collision operator, I have the fluid variables, but remember that these fluid variables are integrals over directions of the photon temperature perturbation. So really this equation is, what is hiding in this equation is that this is an integral differential equation. Integral because these fluid variables are really integrals over n hat of theta uh, times n hat, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one way to write this equation. And we're gonna use it tomorrow to derive the line of sight solution for CMB anisotropies. And then the other way, which is completely equivalent, is to write this integral differential equation for the continuous variable n hats. Instead, we can write it as a discrete series of coupled differential equations for the photon multiple moments. And this is called the Boltzmann hierarchy. And the first two equations of the Boltzmann hierarchy are the continuity equation, which states that Thomson scattering conserves photon number. And the second equation is the momentum equation, which quantifies how photons and baryons exchange momentum through Thomson scatter. So I will stop here and tomorrow we will take it from here and we will derive the line of sight solution 
And then from, so from this first expression, from the first way of writing the Boltzmann equation, we'll derive the line set solution. And from this first, the second way we'll derive uh, the uh, acoustic oscillations, the evolution of acoustic oscillations when photons and baryons are tightly coupled in the early universe. Thank okay. you, Yasina. Thank you very much. Um, any further question for Yasina? Sure. Integral part in the integral, when I said, you mean the integral differential equation, the integral part is that theta zero is integral of theta. So I have an equation for theta of n, which is related and also VB is proportional to the integral e to n prime n prime theta of n prime, okay? So theta is related to the integrals of theta on the right-hand side. And so the Boltzmann hierarchy is a, is a way to transform this continuous integral differential equation into a series of discrete uh, coupled ordinary differential equations. Good. Any other question? So there is a question. Total number conservation. We talked about role of forbidden transition for each atom. Are these two phenomena happening in different regimes? Yes. So yesterday when I talked about indeed the two photon transition, so these two photons, you're absolutely right, do not conserve uh, photons. And also even the you know, Lyman alpha transition, you know, and all of the uh, transitions of hydrogen, they add photons to the CMB spectrum. So one of the assumptions that I mentioned yesterday was breaking down in the Sahai equilibrium uh, approximation. Hiding in Sahai equilibrium approximation is assuming that the CMB is a perfect black body at all frequencies or all energies. And that is not true around the Lyman alpha transition or around these two photons, which whose energy sums to 10.2 electron volt. Okay. At these energies, the photon spectrum is really not at all a black body and you have to solve for uh, the spectral dependence, the frequency dependence by radiative transfer. What this lecture was about today is about if you want the bulk of the CMB photons. The CMB photons around uh, with energies which are typical, with energies which are uh, of order the temperature of the CMB. And for those, uh, the only process that can, you know, the, the only way of interacting with photons is through Thomson scattering. Does it make sense? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, any other question? Uh, I have a question. Okay. Please go ahead. So it's still related to the theta zero. Um, so let, let me just make sure I get this right. So the, the, the multiple contribution, basically all directions in space, uh, it's gonna look the same uh, looking from earth, for example. But if, if I move to another point in space, uh, the value of theta zero can change, right? That's right, that's right. So theta zero, Depends, so, uh, <clears throat> oh, sorry. Yeah. So theta zero still depends on time and still depends on position, right? So okay. monopole means angular average of the direction of, of pro propagations of photons, but this monopole can vary from place to place. I see, yeah, that was part of my confusion before because I, I thought it was just a constant and you could redefine the background oh, variables. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Right. So yeah, monopole does not mean homogeneous. Yeah, good, thank you. Good, any other question? Okay, I don't see any. Very good, so let me thank uh, on behalf of everybody you've seen for the lecture and uh, we reconvene uh, tomorrow. Thank you. Okay.